When Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Church of Wittenberg, he sparked a reformation not only of theology and church practice, but also worship and congregational singing. Let the people sing was the cry of the Reformation, and Luther and others wanted to bring singing back to the people. Martin Luther famously observed, Indeed, I plainly judge and do not hesitate to affirm that except for theology, there is no art that could be put on the same level with music. Martin Luther's most notable reform with regard to the music of worship was to put singing back into the mouths of the people. The process by which he accomplished this goal follows similarly the path by which he reformed the Mass. First, Luther removed any heretical texts from the current hymns that were in existence. Commenting on the songs of the Roman Church, Martin Luther observed this, and indeed, they also possess a lot of splendid, beautiful songs and music, especially in the cathedral and parish churches. But these are used to adorn all sorts of impure and idolatrous texts. Therefore, we have unclothed these idolatrous, lifeless, and foolish texts and divested them of their beautiful music. We have put this music on the living and holy word of God in order to sing, praise, and honor it. We want the beautiful art of music to be properly used to serve her dear creator and his Christians. He is thereby praised and honored, and we are made better and stronger in faith when his holy word is impressed on our hearts by sweet music. Yet this was not enough for Luther. Very soon, he insisted that the people sing in their own vernacular language. This is an argument that he rooted in the Bible itself. Luther said this, Thus it was not without reason that the fathers and prophets wanted nothing else to be associated as closely with the word of God as music. Therefore, we have so many hymns and psalms where message and music join to move the listener's soul, while in other living beings and sounding bodies, music remains a language without words. After all, the gift of language combined with the gift of song was only given to man to let him know that he should praise God with both word and music, namely, by proclaiming the word of God through music and by providing sweet melodies with words. Because of Luther's belief in the power of music as a gift from God, he wanted the music to be in the language of the people, not Latin, which they no longer understood, but German, the language of the people in the pew. He said this in the preface to his Latin Mass. I also wish that we had as many songs as possible in the vernacular, which the people could sing during the Mass, immediately after the gradual, and also after the Sanctus and Agnus Dei. For who doubts that originally all the people sang these which now only the choir sings and responds to while the bishop is consecrating? But poets are wanting among us, or not yet known, who could compose evangelical and spiritual songs as Paul calls them, worthy to be used in the church of God. I mention this to encourage any German poets to compose evangelical hymns for us. The first natural step in that direction was to begin translating the available Latin hymns into German. Examples include Allein Gott in der Höhe sei er from All Glory Be to God on High by Nicholas Decius in 1523 from the Latin Gloria in Excelsis, and Com Heiliger Geist, Come Holy Ghost, by Martin Luther himself in 1523 from Veni Sancti Spiritus from the 13th century, and Christum wir sollen loben schön, Now Praise We Christ, again by Martin Luther in 1524 from the Latin A Solis Ordus Cardine from the 5th century. Furthermore, Luther borrowed tunes from Gregorian chant and other Roman Catholic office hymns for his early German hymns. Examples include All er und Lob soll Gottes sein in 1541 from the 10th century Gloria Tempori Pascali and 
Kyrie Gott Vater in Ewigkeit, 1541, from the 12th century Kyrie Fons Bonitatis. However, translating from a syllable-timed language like Latin to a stress-timed language like German produced a somewhat awkward hymn that didn't feel right within the original Latin tunes. But regardless, Luther recognized that this is where the process must begin. He couldn't expect an indigenous hymnody to develop overnight, and he was convinced that the indigenous Christians in his culture must not ignore the vast wealth of Christian hymnody that had developed in the tradition of the church. And so, Luther recognized the value in at least beginning with translations of what was already available in Latin, even if the translations did not quite feel natural yet. But Luther did desire to cultivate a truly German hymnody. And so his next step was to begin writing new German texts of the same quality and character of the Latin texts, but with poetry that was stress-timed, like German was. He still sometimes used tunes that were available to him from the Latin tradition, which continued to be awkwardly matched with the new German lyrics. But he said this, I would very much like to have a true German character, for to translate the Latin text and retain the Latin tone or notes has my sanction, though it doesn't sound polished or well done. Both the text and the notes, accent, melody, and manner or rendering ought to grow out of the true mother tongue and its inflection. So Luther then began to collect the best of German folk tunes to use with the new German texts. Sometimes this was successful, but other times the strong association of a tune with its secular lyrics caused distractions. Luther also did have available to him German sacred folk hymns that he could readily bring into the church. These were Christian songs that had been written by Germans in years past, not for corporate worship, which had been in Latin, but for daily devotion. Many of these were usable in the now German language services. And then finally, Luther encouraged Germans to write new tunes that flowed naturally from German syllabic stress, often employing the traditional bar form AAB of German folk tunes. Even then, he and other musicians modeled their new tunes after the noble character of the Latin chant melodies. Albert Schweitzer notes that Luther's Ein Festeburg was woven out of Gregorian reminences. But they wrote the tunes so that the cadences matched the stress-timed nature of the German language. Because the church had eradicated any significant pagan influences in the West, the Reformation church no longer really had to worry about being distinct from the pagan culture in the same way as previous times. The musical forms cultivated in the church were passed down and used with the secular music of the day as well. Remember, by this time in Western history, virtually all musical forms, whether in high culture or in folk culture, had been cultivated within the Judeo-Christian tradition. This meant that similar to the situation of Old Testament Hebrews, the tunes used for folk love songs, for example, were of the same noble character as hymn tunes. As Peter Lutkin explains, even the love song of Luther's time was a serious and weighty affair. So-called secular culture was secular only in the subject matter of the text, not in the musical forms used. I'll use this opportunity to dispel one popular myth about Martin Luther. People often argue that since Luther used bar tunes, we should be able to use the kinds of music played in bars today. However, these people confuse the common medieval bar form that Luther used in many of his hymns with tavern songs. Bar form was a common musical form that was nurtured in the church. It is a form consisting of two identical musical lines followed by a contrasting section, A, A, B. Many of Luther's hymns, like Ein Festeburg, A Mighty Fortress, are written in this bar form, which has nothing to do with taverns. 
Yet, even though no prominently pagan culture existed in the West during this time, Reformation hymnody was still distinct from segments of secular culture that expressed values contrary to the scriptures. Sometimes because of distracting associations, Reformation church leaders stayed away from some folk tunes even though the musical forms themselves were compatible with Christian affections. A prominent example of this is Martin Luther's use of a secular folk tune for one of his hymns. Contrary to popular belief, this was the only example of Luther using a secular tune, and even in that case, he eventually changed the tune because he was embarrassed to hear the tune of a Christian hymn sung in inns and dance halls. Luther was also careful to avoid what he called carnal music music that stimulated the base passions. Luther argued that good music would actually wean young people away from carnal and lascivious songs and interest them in what is good and wholesome. Martin Luther's genius was that he combined the most accessible of high art with the best of folk art to create the German Lutheran chorale and his efforts produced scores of influential German hymnals. In 1524, the earliest known collection of hymns was published by Luther and his followers, beginning with the Achter Liederbuch, which contained eight hymns, that's what the title means, four of which were written by Luther himself. Two other important hymnals were published in 1524, and Kirien Oder Handbuchlein, Little Handbook, and Geistliche Gesangbuchlein, little book of sacred songs. The first of these contained 25 hymns, 18 penned by Luther, and the second contained 38 hymns, 24 by Luther. Luther personally supervised the publication of both the second and third collections, as well as several others between 1526 and 1545. His best-known hymn, Ein Festeburg ist unser Gott, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, first appeared in the 1529 collection, and the 1545 publication included all but two of his 37 hymns. Listen to the beauty and richness of his most famous hymn. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe, His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. These lyrics are actually a paraphrase of Psalm 46, expressing confidence and comfort in the Lord's protection of his people. In Hymns to the Living God, we chose to use a harmonization composed by Johann Sebastian Bach, whose church music rose as a direct result of Luther's worship reforms. Hymnody flourished in later Orthodox Lutheranism, and the Lutheran chorale really set the standard for four-part hymnody to come. Two important examples are by Philip Nicolai in 1599, and these are often called the king and queen of chorales because of their textual and musical quality and the standard they set for hymns after them. Other German Lutheran chorales are worthy of note because of the standard that they set for hymns to come. The first is, Out of the Depths I Cry to Thee, to the tune Aus Tiefer Not. This is a lesser known hymn of Martin Luther. It's actually a paraphrase of Psalm 130, written earlier than A Mighty Fortress in 1524. It's an expression of true repentance and confidence in God's power to forgive through Christ. Luther wrote the melody as well, and his lyrics were translated into English by the well-known translator Catherine Winkworth in 1863. The next example is Christ Jesus Lay in Death's Strong Bands, to the tune Christ Lag in Todesbanden. This is another important hymn of Martin Luther, written also in 1524. It's a hymn celebrating Christ's death and resurrection. Luther based this text on the older Latin Victime Pascali. The tune was also originally a Latin melody from around 1100, and it was adapted in 1524 by Luther's first hymn tune collaborator, Johann Walter. 
Next, to avert from men God's wrath to the tune Huss. Martin Luther adapted this communion hymn text in 1524 from John Huss, the Bohemian reformer and martyr from a hundred years prior, who wrote the original hymn in 1410. The tune was composed for this text and included in the 1628 Cantional Germanicum in Dresden. Next, Now Thank We All Our God, to the tune Nun Dunket Alle Gott. The Thirty Years' War was fought in Central Europe between 1618 and 1648 as part of the counter-Reformation strife between new Protestants and Roman Catholics. Lutheran pastor Martin Rinkert wrote this hymn, often called the Tadeum of Germany, in the midst of the war. Rinkert conducted as many as 50 funerals in any given day during the conflict, including that of his own wife. The tune was composed by one of the most influential second-generation Lutheran chorale composers, Johann Kruger, in 1647, and harmonized in 1840 by Felix Mendelssohn. Ah, Holy Jesus, to the tune Herz Liebster Jesu. This hymn, most appropriate for use in remembrance of Christ's atoning sacrifice, was written in 1630 by Lutheran pastor Johann Hiermann. The tune was composed by Johann Kruger in 1640 and was frequently used by Johann Sebastian Bach. Jesus Priceless Treasure, to the tune Jesu Meine Freude. A stunningly beautiful text and tune about Christ, this hymn was written in 1653 by Lutheran theologian Johann Frank, and the tune was composed in the same year by Johann Kruger. Bach used this chorale as well, and we in Hymns to the Living God used his harmonization. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, to the tune Lobe den Herren. This is one of the most well-known Lutheran chorales, it was a hymn written in 1680 by Lutheran pastor Joachim Neander, and the tune comes from a collection of Lutheran chorales from 1665. Interesting piece of trivia, Neander often held religious services in a particular valley that was later called Neander's Valley. This valley became famous when in 1656, the remains of an ancient man were found in that valley, aptly named the Neanderthal Man. Sing praise to God who reigns above, to the tune Mit Freuden Zart. Another second-generation Lutheran hymn writer and theologian, Johann Schutz, wrote this hymn of praise in 1675. This hymn has an even deeper connection with the Reformation with its tune, which was included in the Bohemian Brethren's Kirche Gesangbuch in 1566. The Bohemian Brethren trace their theological lineage a hundred years prior to Martin Luther with John Huss's reforms in Bohemia. These Christians would later become the Moravians, significant hymn writers themselves. Jesus still lead on to the tune Salen Brautigam. Speaking of Bohemian Brethren, Nicholas von Zinzendorf was a third-generation Lutheran pietist who offered a place for Bohemian brethren to live in Germany when they were expelled from their own country. Zinzendorf wrote several excellent hymns, including this one in 1721. The tune comes from 80 years earlier by Lutheran composer Adam Dreze. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, to the tune Germany. This is another important hymn by Nicholas Zinzendorf. It is about the imputed righteousness of Christ, and he wrote it in 1740. And so from the German Lutheran heritage in the 16th and 17th centuries, we find some of the most important and influential congregational songs. These hymns were translated later into other languages and made their way into other Protestant traditions as well.